Okay, let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Father, dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all your blessings of this past week, and of the past Sabbath. And uh, we invite your presence into our hearts, into our study, and into our plans for the week, and the worries and concerns that we have about this message, this movement, and our personal concerns about the decisions in our lives. We yield all these things to thee. We ask that you can help us to trust in your providence and that we can cooperate with you in the work that you're doing in the hearts of others as well as in our own hearts. Be with us in this study, enlighten our minds, help us to see these things clearly and correct any error we may have in our understanding. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Now, we have lots of things uh, to cover, and I don't think it's going to be a, we're going to be able to cover this all in a week or anything like that. Um, there's some papers that uh, Dwight uh, put together. For us that were uh, uh, we're very thankful for thanks for doing that Dwight it's a lot of work so he's given us the notes for Joshua 16 16 through 21 and we also got um, Ron's uh, uh, notes and questions for Joshua 21 which we're not obviously going to have time to do today it might be I'm not sure when we will get how far it how long it'll take us to get to chapter 21 now, um, chapter 15 is the allotment for Judah. And um, so when we deal with uh, Joshua here, I don't know if we had notes um, for Joshua 15. I don't see them. But um, we had read a little bit here before. If you t didn't, didn't I send something up to you yesterday? For Joshua 15? Yeah. Um, I didn't see Joshua 15. But maybe, maybe I, because I would have downloaded it. I always download everything right away. I got a Joshua 21 from you. Um, so, <clears throat> just checking. Yeah, so I don't see a Joshua 15 file. Did you put do notes for Joshua 15 that you know of? Yeah. Just a um, second. I'm opening my email client again. Yeah, you, you mentioned that you're, oh, here it is. I found it. So I didn't download this one. So good. We got your notes. This is much more helpful. Um, yeah, that one was sent April 2nd, so uh, I should have seen it, but for some reason, guys did see the email, but it did, oh, I downloaded it on my other computer. <laughs> That's why. Okay, that would explain it. Okay, so we'll, we'll open up this. Um, So this is Joshua 15, and um, so do we want to go through, do you, um, have you studied into this? I mean, I know you put the notes. Do you have some thoughts on this, Dwight, already? But do you there, there are a few thoughts, yes. Okay. Well, we'll start reading this here. Um, this then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah by their families, even to the border of Edom. Uh, the wilderness of Zin southward was the uttermost part of the south coast. 
and their south border was from the shore of the salt sea from the bay that looketh southward um, and uh, this word a uh, bay just means tongue so it's just a a descriptive word for the word bay um, so it's a tongue of water that comes into the land and their south border was the, from the shore of the salt sea from the tongue that looked southward right so uh, where is this border well, i was taking that as being along the lines of the dead sea so right so this is uh was the border from the shore of the salt sea from the tongue that looked southward so they have this south border that goes down along uh, where the salt sea is, the Dead Sea, uh, goes south. And that's going to be on the border of Edom. So Edom is on the east side of that. Right? Okay, yeah. Okay, so. Um, and then we have, uh, and it went out to the south side to Meleka Krabim, uh, and passed along to Zin and ascended up on the south side unto Kadesh Barnea and passed along to Hezron and went up to Ader and fetched, fetched a compass to Karka, Kakara, Karkea. Um, so the going up to Akrabin is uh, another way of translating it because that's what Meleka means. Me'aleha. And um, so it gives us some references. Then your south quarter shall be from the wilderness of Zin along by the coast of Edom, and your south border shall be to the uttermost coast of the Salt Sea eastward. And they removed from Ezai and Geber and pitched in the wilderness of Zin, which is Kadesh. So we know we have this the wilderness of Zin in the south, and you have Kadesh Barnea, which is in the southern part. That's where they had. Uh, the 12 spies in the rebellion was at Kadesh Barnea. Okay, now one, yeah. one, one other point. When we're looking at this on Kadesh Barnea, yeah. would, we, would we look at the name here as meaning the desert of a fugitive? Um, okay, well. So. Now, where, do you, where do you get your definitions from? I'm I'm pulling this up at the moment out of Esword. Okay. Now Kadesh, so, Kadesh is holy, right? Um so Kadesh, Kadash, Kodesh, Hakadesh, Hakodesh. They're all words that mean to be separated. Because uh, that's what the idea of holy is to be uh, set apart. And um, so, so that's the way that I look at Kadesh. Um, you know, it's, it means, often means, is translated to sanctuary or holy place. Uh, this word bar and uh, nua is what they have. Uh, so bar is like a field and uh, and somebody who's wandering in a field. Uh, so like a vagabond, right? So to wander in a field. So this is um, this holy place of wandering in the field. I mean, if I was trying to take it um, in its meaning, uh, the holy the field of the holy wanderer or something like that. I mean, I'm not sure, but you're saying it means what? What I'm saying, when, when I'm looking at this, <clears throat> it's what Esort is using is saying that this is the same as Hebrew 6, 9, or 4, 6. So, yeah, Strong's you're looking at. Right. Okay. And it's compounded of a correspondent to Hebrew 1, 2, 5, 1. Which is bar. And a derivative of Hebrew 5, 1, 2, 8. Which means... Uh, the desert of a fugitive, right? Right. So this is um, the the wilderness wandering. Um, 
is probably what this is referring to, right? Kadesh of the wilderness wandering. And in some ways, that's what Barnea means. It means the place of the wandering of the fugitive, such as the Israelites um, fleeing Egypt. But it also has the meaning of, of Kadesh or sanctuary. So they had a sanctuary in the wilderness um, as they fled from Egypt. Didn't Jacob also have a, a sanctuary in the wilderness as he fled from his brother? Okay, okay explain. You mean by setting up um, Bethel you're talking about, or what are you? I'm speaking, I mean, when, when he left his, when he left his parents' camp. Yeah. His brother didn't really know what direction he was going to take. He had, he could assume, but he didn't know exactly. Yeah. So, in a way, his wandering in the desert to get to his uncle Laban protected him from Esau. Okay. Um. But when, when I was looking at that and then looking also at Hezron, mm -hmm. what, what would you show as a meaning with Hezron in the Hebrew? Okay, well, it's, it means surrounded by a wall or like a courtyard. Okay. And Adar? Um, well, Adar, that's, that's the 12th month of the year, but it does mean exceeding glorious. Um, magnificent, glorious, honorable. Um, So if this if this is these two cities combine, they form a glorious courtyard. Mm -hmm. Now yeah, we have things that sort of deal with the sanctuary symbolism, is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because Judah then is the place where the sanctuary is going to end up in the tribe of Judah. Okay, and and then you're going to have, um, so let me just move here. And from thence it passed toward Aslan and went out into the, unto the river of Egypt, and the goings out of that coast were at the sea. This shall be your south coast. So um, the river of Egypt is this river that comes off, like that, well, flows into the Mediterranean, um, sort of halfway between um, Jerusalem and Egypt. Depends where you think of as Egypt, but between the Delta, I guess, and uh, and Jerusalem. So it's it's just the that the corner border of of Judah there along the Mediterranean. I don't know how many people are familiar with the geography there, but it's mentioned quite a few times in scripture, uh, the river of Egypt. That doesn't give us a reference here, but um, I'll just look it up quickly here. So it shows up one, two, three, four. Um, I'm going to go for the exact phrase. Shows up a few times. River of Egypt, one, two, three. Well, as far as that actual river, um, it's going to show, like in Genesis 15, 18, uh, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. 
and Numbers 34, 5. And the border shall fetch a compass from Asmon unto the river of Egypt, so similar to what we have in Joshua, and the goings out of it shall be at the sea. And Joshua 15, 4, which we just read, and Joshua 15, 47 is going to talk about uh, uh, the river of Egypt as well, the towns and, and so forth in that area. And in 1 Kings 8, 65, and at that time Solomon held a feast, and all Israel went with him, a great congregation, from the entering in of Hormath unto the river of Egypt, even before the Lord our God, seven days and seven days, even 14 days, dealing with the dedication of the temple. And, um, and in 2 Kings 24, 7, the king of Egypt came not again any more out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt unto the river Euphrates, all that pertain to the king of Egypt. And Second Chronicles uh, refers again to that dedication of the temple, the, the river of Egypt. So, so that phrase is found seven times in, in scripture, according to Esword search. And, um, Any thoughts on that? Well, it is interesting that it's found seven times. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and the east border was the Salt Sea, even unto the end of Jordan. And their border in the north quarter was from the Bay of the Sea at the uttermost part of Jordan. So, uh, So where would this be? Because this is your east border going up, it's covering the Dead Sea. So it's going northward instead of southward. So the Bay of the Sea at the outermost part of Jordan. Where would that be? Well, other would be what furthest point. Okay, so yeah, so we have uttermost um, so the eastern border of the tribe of Judah will go all along the Dead Sea and it's and when we get to the end of Jordan so we would think uttermost that would be where the Jordan falls into the Dead Sea right okay correct yeah yeah so so that's the that's the lowest part of of the Jordan River. So it's not it's not going it's not it's not the line is not along the Jordan, according to what it says here. It's just going to be uh, the Dead Sea. So all that border along the Dead Sea, that's going to be uh, the part of their border. Um, just bringing up this graphics viewer here to look at this. Yeah, so basically, um, you're going to see that Benjamin is going to be just north of Judah, and it's going to it's going to be just uh, have that part dealing with the the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea. It's going to be right along there. So, um, okay. Somebody have a comment? And the border went up to Beth Hogla and passed along the north of Beth Araba. And the border went up to the stone of Bohan, the son of Reuben. And the border went up toward Deber from the valley of Achor and so northward looking toward Gilgal. That is before the going up of Adumim, which is on the south side of the river, and the border passed toward the waters of En Shemesh, um, and the goings out thereof were at En Rogel. So um, it's going to mention some of these other places later on, dealing with the other borders of Reuben. Um, so, so we'll see that in chapter 18, where they're going to deal with that. Um, and then uh, mentioned in Rogel in Second Samuel, 
and uh, also in 1 Kings 1 verse 9. So we have these referenced. Now the meanings of these, these names of these places, anybody know what Shemesh is? So you've got the, the water towards the waters. Well, I'm going to go back, I guess, here to verse 6. So in verse 6, We have Beth Hogla. Beth Hogla, yeah. And, and every time we see Beth, of course, it's house of something. Uh, yes, though sometimes it means daughter because they're actually really the same word. Okay. Uh, but also, you it as Beth, but, but um, sometimes it does mean daughter. And why does it do this? I'm sorry, that word you said was daughter as in son and daughter? Yeah, daughter. So uh, the word house and the word daughter, the word daughter comes from the word house. Interesting. Yeah. So Beth Hogla, would that be house of a partridge? Um, yeah, so there's a house, house, house of a partridge, partridge the place of a partridge. Yeah, and so Baith, Beth, and, and if you look up this word here, it says uh, the word Beth means a house in the greatest variation of applications, especially family, etc. Court, daughter, um, door, plus dungeon, so it has different things, so, so it can mean daughter as well. And then Hogla is a partridge. So, and then, then we also have Bethabara. Yeah, and is, is that not the house of a desert? Yeah, Araba is a desert. So it's um, and and usually a kind of a valley. So, uh, or a place of de depression, um, where de not emotionally depressed, but physical depression. And um, yeah, so that's what you have there, Bethabara, and then the stone of Bowen. And, and of course, stone is Eben, right? Like in Ebenezer. So, um, and so this Bowen means like a thumb. So, so, it's, uh, so I think that the boy refers to a thumb-shaped stone or something like that. But this is going to be the border then going up on the north, which is going to border Reuben. So it's not talking about the part bordering Benjamin, but the part bordering Reuben. And um, so where is that here? Um, yeah, so Benjamin, where's Reuben now here in this? So they're going to talk about Reuben. So this is going to be just this border um, right by the Salt Sea, because Reuben is going to be on the east side of the Dead Sea. Right. So it's just saying there's this Beth Haran. So they're going to have... Uh, just this little bit of land, just a couple of miles or whatever strip of the Jordan River that's bordering on Reuben. And, and Benjamin's going to be, they're kind of wedged in between ben Benjamin and Reuben, according to the map I have here. So, so that's just on the north there. And... Um, And then we have uh, verse seven, and the border went up toward Deber from the valley of Achor. Um, so we got Deber, that means, um, well, I'm not sure, sanctuary, but it's, it's obviously not the, the sanctuary that we have, uh, like a shrine uh, is the idea of that word. And then from the valley of Achor, and Achor means to trouble, right? 
we've run it right. for. And then towards Gilgal, and that means a wheel, right? So we've run into that as well. Um, is before the going up of Adumim. Um, now, uh, you can see the word there, like the word Adam in there, or the word of Idumea or Edom in there, and it, it means a red color, right? So red ones or ruddy ones. So I'm not sure what all this means here as far as trying to take these names of these places. And then we got uh, in Shemesh, Shemesh, and and N is just a word that means foundation. And Shemesh, we should know that that means the sun. That's the Hebrew word for the sun, right? The sun in the sky. So is that is that foundation of the sun or would that be fountain of the sun? Oh, fountain of the sun, pardon me. It's fountain of the sun, not foundation. I was reading it wrong. Yeah, so, so um, and this is within Rogo as well, fountain of the fuller. So a fuller is somebody who washes clothes, right? Okay, so is that is that fountain of a fuller or is it fountain of a traveler? Okay, um, let me see what, uh, so Strong says fountain of a traveler. So they have a different etymology here for the word. Um, and the word there, N, means I. So that's why they call it like a well or a fountain is like an I. Um, um, yeah, so they're using a completely different word there. So they don't, they don't look at it as the same. Um, yeah, so they're taking it as... What are they doing here? Hmm. So they're they're somehow uh, taking this word because the word does mean traveler, the 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 latter part of it. But in Dra Brown Drivers Briggs, when it looks at this. Um, it gives a different interpretation, so not sure why. Well, as as we're looking at this, yeah, and from part of the conversation yesterday, when we were when we were assessing this as far as the different tribes, yeah one of the points that had been brought to my mind and that I was led to bring out was, could we place the first four tribes as being symbols of the for messages second. of Revelation 14 and 18? Yeah. So if this was the case, we have these cities that are like the fountain of the traveler. Would, would a traveler not also represent those at the end of the world that are traveling to the heavenly Canaan and preparing to leave this earth? Is it possible that they have to go through a desert or a time of basically a tarrying time between the time that their message is given and their message is accepted, such as July 18th, until the, the message becomes fully revealed at the Sunday law. Hmm. I don't know. I, I, I don't see enough to say that. Okay do it that way i mean i know what you're saying i just don't um, it's all too subjective i mean it's not that it can co it contradicts anything um 
yeah, so this word, so why they do translate it, why Brown Drivers Briggs translates it as Fountain of the Fuller, um, could have something to do, because this has to do with foot, to go on foot. Um, so there's probably just some kind of implication. Uh, but it can also do mean walk along, move the feet, to be a tail bearer, a slanderer. Uh, to go about as an explorer or a spy, a spy. Right. Does, so, so, yeah. Does not a fuller make the clothes white? Yeah. So could this not be referring to the characters that need to be made white in order to be accepted? Well, especially when you see it in the context of a tail bearer here too. So. Um, and to slander. So it's almost like these two opposite meanings tied together with this. But um, anyway, it's, I just think though, it's, it's a little bit subjective, you know, at least for me to try to go and take these names and, and to, to make anything of them. Um, I mean, there's a lot of names here. And you could put them together and tell lots of different narratives. But um, I don't know. There, there isn't, for me, anything that really jumps out that I say, oh, that's what this means. But uh, I, know what, I know what you're saying. Um, So then we have in verse eight, and the border went up by the valley of the son of Hinnom unto the south side of the Jebusite. So we would know the valley of Hinnom, that's by Jerusalem. And you can see, of course, by the side of the Jebusite, the same is Jerusalem, and the border went up to the top of the mountain that lieth before the valley of Hinnom westward, which is at the end of the valley of the giants northward. So this border is going to come down then um, from this area of the Dead Sea, right? So we're from this border with uh, Benjamin, and it's going to come down. Uh, uh, by Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is really close to the border of Judah. It's not like Jerusalem, even though you have Benjamin right above it. And, uh, and this is one of the issues that we're going to have to deal with later, how we deal with Benjamin and Judah. So any thoughts on that uh, at this point? You know, we have a lot to deal with as far as Benjamin and Judah coming up. Right. Yeah. So, and which is at the end of the valley of the giants northward. And the border was drawn from the top of the hill unto the fountain of the water of Nephtoah and went out to the cities of Mount Ephron. And the border was drawn to Baalot, which is Kerjeth Jerem. So this border here, um, Here it's just going to refer refer to Joshua eighteen sixteen, and the border came down to the end of the mountain that lieth before the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is in the valley of the giants on the north, and descended to the valley of Hinnom to the south south to the side of Je Jebusi on the south, and descended to Enrogel. So this is just going the other direction, of the way they're describing this border, and in Joshua eighteen. Verse 16, um, it's going to be talking about the tribe of Benjamin, right? So in that section. So you're going to see that uh, they're bordering Benjamin. Does that make sense to people? What, uh, if Can you visual it or do you want to see the map that I have? Show the map. Just show what we have here. A visual may help. Yeah. So it's 
So what we see here is uh, right here, here's the Dead Sea. There is Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And you can see Benjamin here. This is the border that it was just described. They described this border with Reuben and Gilgal and, and this uh, border here that's going to come down. The Valley of Hinnom is right here. And that's going to be Jerusalem. And, and they're going to describe the same thing, but going the other direction when they describe the border of Benjamin. So they're describing the border from east to west when they're describing this north border of, of Judah. But when they describe it with Benjamin, they're going to go from west to east. But they describe the same border. So that should help a little bit. You can see here, there is the, the bottom of, of this. Now, when we talk about the river of Egypt, that's going to be way over here. Um, I'm not sure they don't name all Besor. Uh, don't name this river. But I think this is the river of Egypt over here that we can't see. So, so this is Simeon, but they're going to describe this as the, the border of Judah. So remember, we said that Simeon is going to be having this area in here. And they're going to name all these cities as cities of Simeon. But technically, Judah is going to have this area over on this side. So Simeon is going to be in here. It's sort of in the center, but they don't show it that way here. They don't show this as part of Judah even though the other map does. Well, this is a more modern map. No, this is a pretty old map. What do you mean I'm modern? sorry, this is an old map? This is a really old one, yeah. This is the old Rand McNally map from a long time ago. Like modern in what way? What do you mean by modern? Well, we can see uh, longitude and latitude lines on it. You don't normally see those on the older, the older map. Okay. Um, yeah, just because this is Rand McNally, this is but this is still a really old map. I mean, the one we saw, the picture that Dwight showed, would have been a pretty modern map. It wasn't very detailed, but. It was just kind of sketchy, too. It wasn't really well-defined. So this is more defined than the other map that we were looking at. But... Um, okay. Yeah, this is, this is a public domain map. So this is a pretty old map that um, the ESORD used um, for the Bible map. So Rand McNally, we think of them as car maps, right? The driving. Right. They've been around for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I've had a Rand McNally map in my possession probably for 50 years. Yeah. They've been around a lot longer than that. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My grandparents used them to come across the country. Yeah, they're, they're in, um, you know, even my grandfather's library, which is, you know, more than 100 years old. So. So they've been around. I don't know when they started, but it's just an American company, I believe, though. Anyway, so, so that it should help us visually to see uh, that part of it. And, and the border was drawn from the top of the hill to the fountain of the water of Neftoa. So we have these places, Neftoa, Bela, and Kirjith Jerim. And the border compassed from Bela westward onto Mount Seir and passed along on to, the, to the side of Mount Jerim which is Chesalon on the north side and went down to Beth Shemesh and passed on to Timna. And, and so these places are going to be mentioned in other scriptures. Um, and um, so we're going to see that in Joshua 18, some of these borders described. Uh, dealing with Reuben and Benjamin. And I think that's mostly Benjamin. And we can look at these names here. So some of them are familiar, some are not.
um, and, and just even going back a little bit. So when we know we have the Valley of Hinnom, that's, that's part of that Jebusite uh, area, area. And uh, let me see here. Um, so Hinnom refers to lamentation. So it's the Valley of Sorrow. And then you have, well, Jebus, I don't know, descendants of Jebus, that's all I have for that, the Jebusite. And Jerusalem, of course, meaning, um, usually sometimes referred to as the city of peace, but it means teaching of peace. Um, Strong's just has, uh, uh, it's a it's a dual plural, so it's not a um, and it's allusion to the two main hills, the true pointing at least of the former reading. It seems to be that of three three nine zero, um, founded peaceful, Yerushalayim, the capital city of Palestine. It says here in Strong's, so um, so we're familiar with Jerusalem, Hinnom. Jebusites, and then in verse 9, we have um, Nephtoa, Bela, and Kerjath Jerem, and Ephraim that we have to look at. So Nephtoa um, opened, that is, a spring, and then Ephron means fawn-like, Bela, the name of three places of Palestine, but it also means a mistress. So it's a feminine form of Baal, right? So basically like uh, um, a lady, but in this case, it uses it like a mistress. And, and it's also another name for Kir, Kirjath Jia, which is Kirjath, Kirjath Jirim. And that means city of forests. And uh, Strong's, uh, just looking at Strong's here. The city of forests, city of towns. Any, any thoughts on any of these words? Dwight, you got some thoughts? I'm just, I mean, some of these, some of these things like Kirjath Jerem. Yeah. Could be either the city of forests or the city of towns. Right. So there's a lot that's being referred to here. Now, now the the word in the feminine that you were that you were just referring to. Is Be this Allah. giving us huh? Be Allah. Yeah. Yeah. So is mystery. this is this giving a a symbolic reference, say, to a church? Well, and yeah, at, at, which is a, a mistress type of church, not a married bride church. Right. Yeah. So then, we're also involving. As we go into into 1510, we're involving Beth Shemesh or the House of the Sun. And Timnah. Mm -hmm. A portion assigned. Yeah. So um, yeah, and and then you have Chesalon, which means hope. Jerem itself, 
is, you know, means forests. So that's just Kirjath Jiram was just using that um, uh, a city. So Kirjath meaning a city uh, and Jiram meaning forests. And then again, Beth Shemesh, the house of the sun, sun temple. Uh, so here we had En Shemesh, which was basically the fountain of the sun. And here we have the house of Shemesh. So a different place. Um, and then this portion assigned is Timna. So that's that's on the northern boundary boundary of Judah. And later on, it's going to be um, Dan is going to uh, take on that area. So, right. So it's the border of Judah that's going to be connected with Dan. Right. Agreed. Okay. So then we have. Um, so, and that, that border where you're, you're talking about this with connected with Dan. Yeah. We get into some of that in, in 1511. But it's interesting to me because this border went out onto the side of Ekron. So it's the side of eradication. Okay. Drawn, yeah. drawn to Shikron. Or she shikaron for drunkenness so is this speaking of the eradication of false doctrine did dan abandon the doctrine that they were supposed to have accepted in order to go further north Did they become drunk with the false doctrine? Yeah. Is this representational of 1957? Well, possibly. I mean, the thing about Dan, Dan is a backbiter. Right. So, um, the, the thing that I always think about with Dan and, and the thing that I see um, when you when you have conflicts, you know, theological conflicts, um, you know, what many people do instead of actually addressing whatever the Bible says, they do backbiting, and and backbiting is this way of um, instead of addressing. The argument you address the person's character in some way and and this can be very um uh you know through just insinuation right so it doesn't have to be very direct um so it's the things you say about a person the attitude you have a person about a person how you treat them even in uh in public sort of the, if you show contempt towards them in some way and it can even can even be disguised as as righteousness but you you end up just doing the work of satan because satan is the accuser of the brethren and, and and this is just one of the main problems that we see everywhere the truth is presented there's a number of tactics that that the enemy can use but the easiest one and and often the most effective one is actually attacking the man so the false doctrine the people who are teaching error will always resort to backbiting it sure does seem like it doesn't it And I would I agree. Think, can I can I can I say something here? I mean, it's so hard to get away from that because it happens so much, and you don't even realize you're doing it in, unless you have a, a conscious understanding of what exactly you are doing. 
you're trying to dismiss it, uh, something that somebody says by belittling a, the character that's saying it. Right. It happens all the time. Right. And, and it has no place because when we're, we're dealing with the, the idea, it's either true or it's not. We, we have to study it out based upon God's word. And it, it's kind of backbiting is a kind of deceit. Um, and, and the truth is never served by it. No, it's not. Is always when we're when we're dealing with an issue, when we're dealing with studying something, we want to look at it in a complete picture. You want to look at the strengths and the weaknesses of an argument, and it doesn't really matter who's giving that argument. You know, so let's say the person is, uh, you know, has some character defects. Maybe he's annoying. You know, you don't like them for various reasons. But it doesn't mean that what they're saying is not true. And of course, you know, when somebody's annoying, we have to try to take a look at ourselves and see why this person is bothering us. You know, our natural tendency is to just blame the person for how we feel uh, about them instead of recognizing that maybe it's telling us more about ourselves how we feel. Well, the question we should actually be asking is, is why does this make me feel like this? Yeah, that's what I always try to do. I'm not saying I'm always successful, but when I feel something, I really try to take a long, hard look at why does what that person's doing making me feel a certain way. And, and that, that's an important part. But the other thing is, we don't, don't need to ask who advocates such a view. We need to ask whether or not it's true. Can it be supported by the scriptures? So when we talk about the false doctrine here, when it comes to Dan, uh, Dan, you know, definitely isn't interested in the truth. But Dan is a backbiter. And, and that's the biggest aspect of Dan that I can see. It, and it's because Dan isn't interested in the truth that Dan is a backbiter. And what Dan has no part in the 124,000. Yeah. So the, the question, not question, but observation is, is this, again, this appears to be, you know, character defects. Mm -hmm. And I have something that I was thinking of while I think it was yesterday or the day before, I can't remember when they were talking about, uh, or when you were talking about the 144,000 being divided by the, the 12. And I think uh, Dwight made a comment about the, um, the character associated with each of those, those individuals or the, the 12. Um, and I think you had made a comment about it, you know, being that's kind of where we're all coming from is these different character uh traits or um flaws uh and we just need to get over those things and it's really hard to do but i've had uh, stress management and you know anger management and conflict resolution and uh those are some of the tools that you need to use is um you know um getting down to what the actual problem is and not focusing on the different character traits. Well, and that can only happen by true conversion. Um, you know, I mean, if you, I mean, you talked about uh, anger management, but um, there's techniques that people use to try to control their emotions. But that doesn't really change the heart. And agree. Yeah. So, um, and this has to do a lot with my upbringing and, and the things I learned as a child. But um, the way that my my parents dealt with these sorts of situations with people is they didn't try to control people's actions. They took every person for who they were, and tried to lift them higher you know, showing acceptance and love, 
uh, but also and not always as successfully as they could have, but have boundaries or consequences. Um, you know, allowing people to make their own choices and see the consequences of their choices. My parents did that with me. And, and I tried to do that with my children as well. I didn't try to shield them uh, from choices and I didn't try to manipulate them to do what I thought that they should do because they don't learn from it. I mean, eventually they grow up and become adults and have to make their own choices. So, um, but when we look at these characters, when, when I think about, I only had seven children, not 12, but um, each of the children are different and they all have strengths and weaknesses. They have a, a part of their character that, well, each, each aspect of a character trait has a strength and a weakness to it. So when we think of somebody as um, uh, lazy, what's what's the what's the flip side of lazy? <laughs> Maybe that's a hard one to do, but busy. What's that? Busy? No, no, that's not what I mean. There's a character trait that can make people seem to be lazy, right? We would say, well, that person's lazy. But what is it? What is the other side of that? What is it? Because there's a good side of that, of laziness, not not the opposite of lazy. Can anybody think what that would be? Why is someone lazy? What personality trait tends to make a person lazy? Not caring. Okay, so partly, yeah. So, I mean, it depends what we mean by lazy. But there are some people, they're very ambitious, right? They can be quite. Yes. Ambitious. And, you know, we might call them A, A type characters or something like that. Yes, I get it. Okay. So, so they can be a bit overbearing, right? Controlling demanding but somebody who who typically is not driven you know we might call lazy right but they're going to have other yes. aspects of their character that can be developed they have to learn diligence but um it may be that they're more accepting or they're more laid back or easygoing that they're they're not on they're not putting other people under pressure right it's maybe not the best one to use, but when you look at each side of a character, there's a strength, there's a strong side of a character and a weak side of a character. Right? Does that make sense? Uh, yes. So, so when it comes to these 12 tribes, these represent the characters of God's people. There isn't, there isn't a godly personality right we're all different but we all have strengths and weaknesses agree and so the 144,000 is not made up of one tribe it's made up of 12 tribes 12 different types of personalities that all have things to overcome what to one person is of little moment to another person is a great a weight grievous to be born right so when we look at people what are we generally judging when somebody rubs us the wrong way what is usually the problem uh you're looking externally well they're they have a different personality than us maybe right well yeah I mean, I don't mean to make this like a psychological thing, but there are personality types. You know, there's people that I would never be friends with because we're way too different. You know, I'm very punctual. Um, now, of course, I'm very patient, so I can put up with people that aren't punctual, but um, they, they might, we might have a hard time uh, actually working together, doing something. 
There's some people I can just get along with easily. I can talk and they already understand what I'm talking about. They already understand what I mean. Some people, I can't communicate with them at all, no matter how hard I try. And it doesn't mean they're bad people is the point that I'm trying to make. Right? Just because people can be exasperating doesn't mean that they're evil. And we need to be able to accept the differences that exist in personalities. But each of us agreeable has, has to overcome with whatever it is we've been given in our nature. And that's going to be different things for different people. The reason why that we need each other, why we need a church, is we need these differences so that we can see the defects in our own character. The problem, with Dan, the problem with Dan is he only sees the defects in the characters of others and never in his own. And that's the one character trait that will never, we, Ellen White talks about it, is the person who, who sees that they're all right when they're all wrong. Right? They can't be helped because they never can accept that they have done anything wrong. And everyone else is the problem. That's Dan. That's an excellent description of Dan. Yeah. And the thing that we have to be is teachable and correctable. And all the other characters, if you look at their stories, you can see in them, I can't think of examples for every one of them, but we can see that all of them have a good side and a bad side, but they all have the ability to change. And if they're going to be one of the 144,000, they are going to change. But God doesn't change our personality when we're converted. No, that's up to us. Well, no, personality never changes. I'm sorry, what was that? Personality never changes. Character changes. They're not the same thing. We were to have a Christ-like character. Right, Christ-like character. But there's no such thing as a Christ-like personality. Personalities are both have, have a side to them that are both good and bad. Character is when we take the personality that we're, we've been born with and we exercise all of the positive traits of that personality and mm -hmm. put to death all mm -hmm. the negative traits of that personality. Right. Yeah, individuality, you know. Yeah, we're, we're still individuals. God doesn't change who we are when we're <clears throat> transformed, when we get a new heart. Recording in progress. Yeah, but you know, I, I get it and I'm there with you, but that's not really what's preached from the pulpit. It's like, it's going to magically happen. You're just going to change. <laughs> and that's not the truth. You, you, this is something that you, the truth. you need to work on to develop that character um, as opposed to the personality as you you have clearly identified there's two different things. Yeah. I mean, they say that your personality is somewhat formed by the time you're about five years old. But, um, I mean, I know who I am as a person because that's all I can speak to with clear knowledge is I'm really the same person I've always remembered myself to be. And um, my mom can testify to that. All of the characteristics I had as a child, I still have as an adult even though I'm now converted, but I still have those, that same personality. And, and some people expect that other people need to be like them in order to be, for them to accept them, right? So some people won't accept people for who they are. When I, and I'm not talking about the sin part of it. I'm talking about the personality part of it. I don't like certain people. 
but I still have to accept them and also interact with them because if I am converted, I should be able to interact with people who are very different and not feel irritated. The Apostle Paul saying, yes, be all, be all things to all people. Yeah. That's what so, so what I can say from looking at these different tribes and the cities that are associated with them, the borders, I think it's describing the different aspects of the personality of each of these tribes. But their character is determined on the choices that they make, because we know that character is about choice. Right? It starts with our our choices, our habits. And as we continue to develop those habits, they start to form our character. So no matter what your personality is, you can still develop the aspects of your personality to be Christ-like. But it doesn't mean that somebody who's an introvert will become an extrovert because he's converted. Because there's aspects of being an introvert that are actually really good. There's aspect, aspects of being an extrovert that are good as well. But I will never be an extro extrovert, no matter how much I've spoken in public, no matter how much I've dealt with people teaching guitar, teaching university. Um, I'm not an extrovert. I, I've developed social skills to some degree. There's still areas in which I cannot I cannot see that is areas in which I'm completely blind to. And that will always be the case because our brains all work differently. We don't all have the same mind. And I think this is an important point as we, we look at these tribes, at least for me, this is the part that I find about it, is we start to see these characters manifested. And in all these stories of these tribes, these characters manifested. And then it's going to be the question of, well, we have, um, you know, this divided kingdom, right? So at some point we're going to have Israel, which is all united under David, who's a type of Christ. And then we're going to see that with his son Solomon, the kingdom is going to be divided. And when that's kingdoms divided, there is... And we're going to look at that, the tribe that's the one tribe that's left, and that's going to be the study on, on Sabbath morning uh, that Dwight's going to do, dealing with Simeon and, and, and so forth. Um, what happens with the division of the kingdom? But we see in the end, in the book of Revelation, that there is going to be 12 tribes. So the question is, why is one tribe, Judah, which of course contains Levite, Levite cities and also Simeon. Um, why is that one tribe, Judah, uh, the one in which the temple is? Because what is Judah? Who is Judah? According to the blessing of Jacob. beside him being the lion he's the lion of the tribe of judah okay not necessarily beside i mean that's the point is he's the lion he's the ruler and in judah the temple is going to dwell right but we're talking in judah the temple will dwell but we're not talking bethlehem because that's Benjamin, or excuse me, we're not talking um, Jerusalem because that's Benjamin. Okay, so but Benjamin's going to end up becoming a part of Judah. Okay, in a sense. So so that's so that's one of the questions we're going to address. But if we think about a person, a ruler, what's our ruler in us as individuals? Our character. Well, our ruler is, is our is our mind, right? 
All right. So our mind is what controls us. And so Judah, being this lion, which is this ruler, um, what, what would that say about Judah as one of the tribes? The thought leader. Okay, the thought leader. Um, the controlling power, the choice, the will. I mean, if we look oh, at, yeah. at Israel as representing the individual, the individual in a sense, we have all of us have all of these different characteristics. So even yes, though we do. talk about this being, you know, different people have different personalities and they can be represented by the different tribes. In a sense, we're, we're all of these, all of these aspects of the character of God's people represent the battle that goes on within each one of us. And yet it's the ruling power of the mind, the, the choice of the will that is going to determine ultimately our destiny. Not our nature. Our nature does not determine our destiny. We can yield to our nature, but that's, that's still the force of the will, right? Right. If I choose to do evil, it's the will that chooses to do evil. Our nature doesn't choose to do evil. I'm looking at uh, Genesis 49.10. It says the scepter, or that could be the mind, right? The ruling power shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. So Christ is to be our ruler until he appears again. Right. So Christ if, is the one. If we consider ourselves like Judah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we know that, you know, in the Laodicean message in five testimonies, um, I can't remember the page. But uh, the illustration that Ellen White gives is that, you know, Christ knocks on the door of our heart, of our mind. And what we can do is remove the rubbish from the door and allow him entrance. So man in and of himself cannot overcome sin. But we do have a choice, and the choice is to open the door to Christ. And he comes in. We have, we have work to do in removing the rubbish from the door. But we can't cleanse the house without Christ. He's the one who comes in and cleanses our hearts. So, so Christ is the one. He's, he's represented by the lion of the tribe of Judah as well, right? So Judah is Christ in that sense, correct? Because he has the symbols of Christ, of Christ ruling. Yes. In our hearts and minds. So the, the illustration, and, and, and I, I don't mean, I sound sort of philosophical here, but when we look at, in a practical sense, we look at the stories of the Bible. These stories are to speak to us about our condition. They're supposed to be speaking to us about the problems that we have in our lives and how God is able to forgive us and also to empower us to overcome. All of the stories in the Bible are stories about us as overcomers in the end. Correct? Agreed. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Jacob, Jacob wrestling with the angel and having his name changed to Israel. That is a story of our victory over sin. Because all of the 144,000 go through the time of Jacob's trouble. And so the stories of the Bible should be speaking to us about our character and about God and how he interacts with us. Now we know they're also prophetic. So the Bible is not just a devotional book. It's not just a story, stories to teach us moral lessons doesn't mean moral lessons aren't there, but it's also a prophetic book. And when we look at the prophecies of the Bible, the one thing I see 
and I've talked about this before, but when I've looked at these wheels within wheels, all of these prophetic lines, we can see how God interacts and controls history. But this really speaks more to me about how God has led in my life. It brings both a conviction that God is real and that everything that he that has happened in my life is God interacting with me. And it brings this power to overcome. So it brings a conviction of sin, not just a not just a knowledge of sin that condemns, but a conviction of sin. And then demonstrates the goodness of God and the power of God in order to overcome in my life in a personal way. So even though I look at these prophecies that deal with nations and history, what I see, God who cares about the individual. Jeff, you have a comment? Your mic's on. Oh, sorry, no. Okay. Yes. And, um, yeah. Getting loud like me. What's that? I said it was getting loud like it was coming for me or something. <laughs> okay. But it wasn't. So not this time. Yeah. So so if we go back to Dwight's point. So Dwight's point was can we take these these sons of Leah, right? Was that it? The first four sons of Leah, yeah. Yeah. And now could we say that they're the first, second, and third angels' message? So um and I, I'm applying it not just for second and third of Revelation 14, but I'm applying it also as the other angel of Revelation 18. Yeah. And, and the fourth. So, but the angel of Revelation 14 is the second angel repeated. So, so we know it's three and, and then the fourth is the second again. So, but, but the point is, you know, can we see it that way? And, and I think we can. But um, in a different way, maybe, than I think that you're talking about, in that when we look at these, these, these tribes and their history, they're representing, to me, for the most part, the personal journey and walk, because all of us have a personal reform line that is the first, second, third, and fourth angel's message. Would you agree with that? yeah yeah it seems is that way right and and we see parminder did this with the book steps to christ but he was very deceptive about what he was doing because what did he say about 9 11 it's baptism but what did he say about it do you remember anybody who was following him i wasn't following him at that yeah, time sorry can't help um, you there Stephen, do you remember what he said about 9-11? That um, from then we're not to sin anymore. Yeah, so after 9-11 you don't sin because it's baptism. And so you have to be perfect before you're baptized. Is that biblical? I don't see it as biblical. No. You're still going through sanctification. Okay, because that's justification, isn't it? All right. Yeah. Yes. So, so God justifies us. So we know in our personal experience, God understands that we can go through justification, even sanctification and judgment. Right. That is, we can go through an experience in where we, we start to reflect Christ's character. But that sometimes we need a renewal of that because the Millerites went through that those three step testing prophetic message, they got to the arrival of the third angel's message, but they could not complete that work. The second angel's message had to come again to them in their lives. Does that happen to us as Christians? Do we go through a work of justification and sanctification and represent Christ to some degree? But then do we have to come back to that sanctification every day? Aren't we supposed to? Right. So the fourth angel's message 
is the second angel's message. And the second angel's message is sanctification, isn't it? Yes. And so, so the messages, the reform line is illustrating that even though there's this work of the gospel, this three-step testing prophetic message, we have to go through it again and again. While well, we're on earth, that work is not completed until the very end. If we, if we were to take a step backwards just for a moment. Okay. And take a look beginning at Genesis 49.10. In the description that is given of Judah. Okay. So Genesis 49 verse 10. I'll just go there so everybody can see it. Okay. Okay, you're screen. Okay, good. So the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal unto the vine. And his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. Mm -hmm. And we often don't look at those two verses there, 11 and 12. We don't. Mm -hmm. So if the garments are being washed with wine, are they not being washed in the doctrine? Are they not being prepared in the doctrine? Mm -hmm. and garment being representational of our character mm -hmm. but binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt so are we not seeing islam here as well being bound unto the doctrine that we find within scripture it would appear that way so our characters are going to have to be able to represent the doctrine that we're finding and that we're examining throughout scripture. Mm -hmm. That would be a difficult concept for many to accept. Even though it's right here. Now, now if if the premise that I was led to present is correct, if Judah is representational of the other angel, the Revelation 18 angel, mm -hmm. he's it the would, fourth. because he's the fourth, fourth son of Leah, that would make Levi the third angel's message, the representation of it. Yes. So the and 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 Levi, his name means like a joining. Right, like the joining of the two sticks. Yeah. So in in our situation here, we're getting to see again, if, if we make a, a further application, Reuben being that of the courtyard mm -hmm. Simeon of the holy place mm -hmm. Levi of the most holy and Judah being the entire experience mm -hmm. because if we're not willing to accept all of the doctrine. How can we then be washing our characters mm -hmm. in that of the blood of the vine or in the blood of Christ? Doesn't seem possible. 
Yeah. And so, so when we look at Judah, so in, as we go through these different allotments, God is casting lots in a sense um, for our character. That is, there's this God's providence provides us with an experience, you know, where we're born, the parents we have, all of these things are God's providence, the people we get to know, the events that happen in our lives, you know, me being in Lambert Church on October 13th doing a calculation. These are all God's providences, the dates we're born. Um, and God has has given us this allotment in life just like he does with the tribes of Israel. But we have to overcome whatever circumstance that we are given. Does, does Dan overcome the circumstance that he's given? No. No. But we have to overcome the circumstance we're given, no matter whether that's something that we think is 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 hard. You know, that it's unfair. Well, well that's there for a reason. Are we are we not given a choice in what we're shown in Revelation 14 and in Revelation 18? Mm -hmm. I mean, Mrs. White is very clear. Mm -hmm. Those that chose not to accept the message of the first angel could not be benefited by the second. Mm -hmm. Those that chose not to be benefited by the second angel could not be benefited by the third. Mm -hmm. She does not say those that chose not to accept the message of the third angel could not be benefited by the fourth, but by implication, it's there. Yeah, well, and the fourth is a repeat of all these messages. So, so it's, it's, it's an opportunity in our life, if we want to put it to the individual. I mean, we go through choices and we fail. But God puts us before those those choices before us again. And we have those choices over. He doesn't. I mean, our whole life is is one choice, but it's not like if we, we fail the first time, that's it. Because we all have failed. Right. And but God brings us over that same ground. Right. We have to walk down that path again and learn from it each time until we see what kind of characters we are and come to a true repentance that cannot be repented of. And that's, you know, and so, so going through this, I mean, we're, we're going through this pretty slowly going through uh, Joshua. And, and as I said, it's going to take a long time at this pace, but I think we can benefit from it. It's, and, and we'll start to see what's what's being said here. Well, one, one of the comments that I'll return to, and I'm not trying to be offensive, but yeah. how do you eat an elephant? Uh, one piece at a time. Okay. In our situation right now, we are confronted with a lot of meat. We're mm -hmm. confronted with a lot of meat that has not been in the past addressed in any kind of depth within the church or within this movement. Mm -hmm. when, when we went into that study on Judges 17 to 22, mm -hmm. that's a study that many, I don't care if you're in the church, out of the church or in the movement, Many avoid that because they just don't want to understand it. They don't want to apply themselves to it. There's pieces of that study that we're going to pick up here within Joshua mm -hmm. that are going to be able to bring it to a point of clarity 
that is going to, I think, be very surprising to many. Okay. Um, I don't see Rosanna here, but you know, she's, she's expressed a few times, you know, about the difficulty of understanding all the numbers. Right. And, and other people have expressed that as well. And, and I try to be sympathetic about it. I mean, cause I know I can't know them all, even though I have a natural affinity for numbers, I can't remember everything, but what this message gives us is this line upon line and and what we haven't really done with it in this movement is we have these lines because that's what we're studying right now understanding the lines and and we would look at these lines and just sort of superficially lay them down and i understand why that is because we have a superficial knowledge of the scriptures we think we understand the bible because we know some of the main stories in it but as we've gone through things, we realize we hardly understand them, even the main stories, but let alone all these little details. But there, with the different minds that we have, we can. some people are going to, to tie into these stories much more than they're going to tie into the numbers. Right? They're going to see these stories and these connections. And all of this geography, the thing is, all of this geography is is tied to the stories that is when you have a story and it mentions a place it's bringing you back to the events all the events that have happened in that place yeah you know, it's like heidi and i we were uh on uh i guess it was thursday we were driving in edmonton because i needed to get her a new bible cover and um ended up uh, we, we ended up kind of going through the old neighborhoods we used to live in now Heidi lived in those neighborhoods you know like 15 years after I lived in them but you know all of these places are tied to stories of our lives and this is this is the way if we had lived through this area and we had 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 these stories told to us about you know, like imagine you're you're living in 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 Israel. I mean, you're confronted all the time with these stories in the Bible. You travel someplace and you can think about, oh, this is where this happened. And so. So these these different things that are given to us in the Bible, I like numbers, but we have geography, we have the family relationships. There's different things that each of us can take. But we have to put them all together to see they're all part of a unit for God speaking to us about the world and prophecy and also speaking to us in our personal life. So I think as we go through these things uh, and every time we look at the name of a city and we start to recognize where it is and the stories associated with it and the times the prophecies that connect these things, like the crossing of the Jordan and Christ being baptized in the Jordan and the number of years between that or, or the different types of symbols like the leagues. All of these things bring this all together into a harmonious whole that tells the same story and puts our feet on the correct path. So our time's gone on. So unless there's any final comments, we can close in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study this morning. And we pray that as we continue throughout this week and the weeks to come to dig into your word in this manner, uh, that you can help us to understand um, your love for us. We pray that you can work in our lives in a powerful way. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen.